Once again, we express our appreciation that you've taken the time uh, to join us for this short study. We're going to continue in our series of lessons on the subject of Bible baptism. We're going to move forward to lesson 11, part number one. And so like several lessons previously, we've divided the lessons into parts, and this one will have a two-part uh, series to it. So lesson number 11, the subject uh, is going to be requirements of Bible baptism. In Matthew chapter 28 and in verse number 19, Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Bible baptism has requirements. And so a requirement is something needed or demanded. And so when one surveys the New Testament and observes the Lord's teaching regarding the subject of Bible baptism, he or she will learn that there are requirements set forth by the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we're going to be taking a look at some requirements of baptism. Notice, first of all, when you think about requirements of Bible baptism, Bible baptism requires an accountable subject. Now, in the cases of New Testament conversions, accountable people were baptized. No exceptions. I want you to think about for a moment with me what it means to be an accountable person. Well, of course, an accountable person is one who's going to take personal responsibility for his or her actions. An individual who's going to take personal responsibility. Now the reality is that God is going to hold us all accountable for how we have lived our lives. In the book of Romans 14 and verse 12, Paul said, so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. I want you to think about in the book of Acts chapter 2. As always, we encourage you to take your Bible out and to Turn the pages with us, or if you have a digital version, to pull up uh, the Bible references. So in Acts chapter 2 and verse 5, it says, On Pentecost there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. And as you read through the book of Acts chapter 2, when you get down to verse 22, we learn that these devout men heard the preaching of Peter. Now, what is it that they heard? When Peter preached in Jerusalem in Acts 2, what is it that they heard? And so they heard, that is, the, the preaching of Peter concerning Jesus of Nazareth. And when they heard Peter, they understood those things that he was teaching or that he was preaching. We know that because in Acts chapter 2 and 37, it says, And they were pricked in the heart and said, What shall we do? They were accountable persons. What did Peter tell the accountable to do and why? Well, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Peter told them to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Notice later on in the book of Acts chapter 16, that is in the case of Lydia and her household, that particular case of conversion, like all the others, involved only accountable people. In Acts chapter 16 and verse number 14, the narrative says, Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. These would have been folks like Lydia who could attend unto things which were spoken of by Paul. You can start in Acts chapter 2 and you can read through Acts chapter 19. Those chapters... From 2 to 19 in Acts record for us various cases of conversion. And what those cases clearly illustrate to us is that Bible baptism requires an accountable subject. 
Notice number two. Another requirement of Bible baptism, that is Bible baptism requires hearing the gospel of Christ. Hearing the gospel of Christ was required before baptism. Let me say that again. Hearing the gospel of Christ was required before baptism. In every case of New Testament conversion. Let me ask this question. What does hearing necessarily infer? So in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 5, God said concerning Jesus, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. The command to hear his Son necessarily infers something. Or hearing in general, right, the command to listen to or hear necessarily infers that there's a message to be heard. And so when God says that this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, hear ye him. That statement by itself necessarily infers that there's a message to be heard. Even before I've heard the message, just the command itself necessarily infers there's a message to be heard. In this case, it's a soul-saving message. It's the message of the gospel. It's the message that rings forth from the authoritative voice of Jesus. I want you to notice the place of hearing in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37 through 30, 41. This is in the conversion of the Jews. And so when you walk through there in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, the Jews first heard... So they heard Peter preaching the gospel. It says in verse 41 that they gladly received the word and then were baptized. Do, do you notice the place of hearing the gospel? They heard the gospel first. They received the gospel with glad hearts. And then they were baptized. They weren't baptized and then heard the gospel. But rather they heard the gospel, received it, and were baptized baptized how about philip the conversion of the eunuch and philip's role in that conversion philip the evangelist went down to samaria and you know what he did he preached christ acts 8 and verse 5 and upon hearing the gospel the samaritans i guess i said the eunuch i got ahead there but and it is true of the eunuch as well in the early part of the chapter of Acts chapter 8, it was the Samaritans. And so Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ to the Samaritans in Acts 8 and verse 5. Later, he does the same with uh, the eunuch. Remember, the eunuch was reading from Isaiah. He didn't understand what he was reading. And so Philip expounds upon those things to him, talking about Jesus, the Christ. Notice in Acts 8 and verse 12 that Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ regarding the Samaritans, they were baptized. Again, in that case, or in the eunuch's case, in any case of conversion, notice the order. That every single case of conversion began with folks first hearing the gospel. In Hebrews 11 and verse 6, the Hebrew writer said, but without faith it is impossible to please God. Contrary to popular opinion, there are some things that are impossible. And no matter how hard one would try, it cannot be done. And for example, if you want to please God, you're going to have to have faith. You're going to have to, to believe. Now, how does belief come? How does faith come? In Romans 10 and verse 17, Paul said, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so open up your Bible and read Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 9, 10, 11. Read in Acts 16. Read Acts 18, Acts 19. Notice all those various cases of conversion of a person and or people. And we would do well to note that in every single one of those cases, the gospel was heard. The message was first preach and so bible baptism requires the hearing of the gospel of christ 
I must hear the gospel of Christ before I am baptized. Of course, hearing the gospels by itself is not enough. Bible baptism requires faith. Again, we just noted in Hebrews 11 and verse 6, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith is a necessary or essential element to salvation. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Who's the saved one in Mark 16, 16? The saved one in that passage is the one who believes and is baptized. And if I don't believe, what will I not do? I will not be baptized. In John 3, 16, it says that God gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Remember in, remember in the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, the man of Ethiopia asked in Acts 8 and 36, what doeth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip responded in this fashion. Philip said that if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Consider with me in the book of John. In John chapter 20. You know the purpose with which John wrote. In John 20 and verse 30. G John writes that Jesus. And truly Jesus did many other signs. In the presence of his disciples. Which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. The son of God. And that believing you may have life in his name. And so John's purpose for writing the gospel is recorded in John 20, 30, and 31. What reason did he give? He says to his, to his audience that you may believe. Explain why the obedient believer's faith is not a blind faith. It was Paul who said we walk by faith and not by sight. But the reality of that statement or declaration obviously being true, divinely inspired, is that such that I have not seen God, but I believe that God is. Uh, we sing a song sometimes uh, entitled, We Saw Thee Not. <laughs> right? So we weren't there, we, you and I, weren't there when Jesus walked on this earth, but we believe. Right? We, we weren't there when Jesus was crucified. We didn't, uh, we weren't eyewitnesses to the crucifixion of Jesus. But we believe. Uh, we were not there when Jesus arose from the dead. We weren't there when the angels announced, He is, he is not here, uh, for He is risen. Uh, why do you seek the living among the dead? They said. Uh, we weren't there when Jesus ascended into heaven to the right hand of His Father. But we believe. We weren't there to be eyewitnesses to the events of the Old New Testament. We didn't live among those characters at that time, but we believe the Bible is, contains uh, real people, real places, and that it reveals to us real events. And so when Paul says we walk by faith and not by sight, certainly uh, it is in that regard. I, I've, I've not seen heaven. The Bible tells me about heaven, so certainly we walk by faith, not by sight. We haven't seen it, but the promise has been made by God. And so we're asked to explain why the obedient believer's faith is not a blind faith. So I believe in God. I believe in heaven. By the way, I believe in the wrath of God just as much as I believe in the love of God. I, I believe in hell just as much as I believe in heaven. Now, I have not seen God. I have not seen Jesus. I have not seen the Holy Spirit. Uh, I have not witnessed uh, heaven or hell, uh, those eternal abodes, but I believe. But that doesn't mean that my faith in God or Jesus or God's word or heaven or hell and things of that nature, that doesn't mean that my faith is blind. Don't let anyone tell you that if you are a believer in God, your faith is a blind faith. No, my faith is not a blind faith. My faith is built and substantiated on the mountain of evidence that is before us. 
And so to be sure, Bible baptism requires faith. Essentially, God has presented to us the evidence. Now, there's evidence in God's word. And so we have the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And so the Old Testament into the New Testament being God's divine revelation. Uh, there's internal evidence. And so I survey the evidence that's presented by God unto mankind through his written revealed word. And so my faith is built upon the evidence that is inside. But there's even more that there's external evidence. We look around at God's creation, right? We look around at this earth and what makes up this earth and, of course, the universe. And think about the human body. Think about mankind, man uh, unique among God's creation because we are created in the image of God. We would call this external evidence. That is, it's outside the Bible. So we have internal, that which is in the written word, but then we can look around and observe God's wonderful creation. We can observe the human body. And God's creation, this creation, testifies to a grand designer. The human body testifies. It's testimony. It's evidence of a grand and great designer. And so in this first part of requirements of Bible baptism, we've noticed three things. We noticed, first of all, that Bible baptism requires an accountable subject, a willing subject. And so no one, in other words, infants are not accountable subjects. Uh, individuals who are not willing to submit to the authoritative voice of God. And so... Bible baptism requires an accountable subject. Secondly, Bible baptism requires hearing the gospel of Christ. Every case of conversion in the book of Acts began with folks hearing the gospel. And we too must begin by hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. Not enough to just hear the gospel, however, we have to believe it. So Bible baptism requires faith. Of course, we do know the Bible says we are not saved by faith alone. James 2.24, uh, James said, you see then that a man is not justified by faith alone or faith only. Nothing by itself in Scripture is ever said to save us. And so, Lord willing, uh, in our next uh, lesson, we're going to look at the subject of repentance, uh, confession, and, of course, then baptism as it relates to the subject of requirements of Bible baptism. Once again, we thank you for taking your time to join us uh, for this short study.